Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of Reddit Podcast Stories. Our first story we'll be reading today. Try to convince my wife to cheat on me? That's why you're a single mom right now instead of a doctor. After that, am I the jerk for telling my wife we can no longer afford to give our dog an allowance? <laughs> and after that, my roommate's entitled boyfriend demands to park his car in our driveway. Now for every thumbs up this video gets, one Karen does not get to convince someone to cheat on their husband. Unfortunately, cheating on your husband's not an option when you look like I do. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. <laughs> Try to convince my wife to cheat on me? That's why you're a single mom right now instead of a doctor. I, 29 male, have known my wife, who's 30 female, and her best friend, Jess, who's 29 female, since we were all 11. We attended middle and high school together, but I wasn't in their social circles at all. I was always one of the sort of nerdy, awkward kids, and the two of them were both very popular. My wife in particular was extremely popular because she was, and still is, extremely beautiful, kind, and intelligent. She was our student body president and valedictorian. Jess was also very pretty. I even had a tiny crush on her back then, and similarly popular. My wife and Jess have been best friends since kindergarten. My wife and I started dating our senior year of high school after we were paired together to complete a project in one of our classes. We realized that we got along really well and she asked me out and I definitely wasn't saying no to her. Jess from the very start did not respect our relationship and firmly believed that my wife could do much better. She has, in the decade plus since, consistently told me that my wife is out of my league that I was lucky she settled for me so young and that my wife belongs with a more attractive and successful man. Now, I'm the first one to admit that my wife is out of my league. She's far more attractive, makes more money, and is just generally an amazing human being. But hearing it so often doesn't exactly feel good. Jess also has tried to convince my wife to cheat on me multiple times and has even tried to set her up with other guys because she doesn't approve of my wife and I being the only partners either of us has ever had. Jess has a daughter who's five, whose father bailed on her and raises her as a single mom. Jess actually dropped out of med school to raise her daughter once she realized the father wasn't going to be in the picture. My wife and I absolutely love her daughter and love having her over. Jess had a date on Saturday night, so she left her daughter with us for the night and came to pick her up on Sunday and stayed for lunch. As I was preparing lunch for everyone and her daughter was playing in the yard, Jess and my wife were talking about her date. Jess was going on and on about how attractive this guy was, how good he was at Boom Chicka Wunt Wow, and all of the details, but I just ignored it. Jess then looked to me and said, You're lucky you locked her down when you were so young before she knew that there was better out there, and then turned to my wife and offered to give her the guy's number in case she wanted to try him out. I got really angry at that point, so I just said, I doubt you know anything about better since your taste in men is why you're a single mom and not a doctor right now. Both of them just stared at me in shock, and then Jess called me a jerk and left quickly with her daughter. My wife has been upset with me since, so I have to ask, am I the jerk? Edit. I just wanted to point out that my wife acknowledges that what Jess said was inappropriate, but thinks that what I said was unnecessarily cruel. It was always Jess's dream to be a doctor like her dad, especially after her dad passed, and now that's probably never going to happen. Jess has said this to me before, so I was aware of it, and my wife thinks it was uncalled for to press on something that's so clearly a pressure point for her. Jess also frequently bemoans the pain of being a single mom and about how all of the guys she goes out with ghost her as soon as she mentions her daughter. This is mainly why my wife is upset with me, because she thinks I purposely hurt Jess, while Jess's comments are a joke and aren't meant to hurt my feelings, which is probably mostly true. Alright, so I talked to Jess. Yeah, everyone said not to apologize, but honestly, sometimes you can acknowledge that you did something bad, even if the other person also did a bad thing. And yes, what I did was bad. Part of the reason I posted here in the first place was because I was feeling guilty about it, because I knew I'd been overly mean to her and I was hoping that this post would make me feel less guilty. That didn't really work, unfortunately. So yeah, I was going to call her to apologize, but Jess actually beat me to it. Apparently, my wife had texted her and told her how I felt about everything she was saying, and that led to Jess deciding to talk to me herself. Honestly, I'm pretty impressed because my wife showed me the texts and my wife didn't actually even tell Jess to apologize, so she did that on her own. 
I do believe it was genuine, especially because when she called me, Jess sounded pretty distressed. So she apologized, profusely actually. She said that she really didn't mean for me to take it seriously and she felt really bad when my wife told her. I talked to her for a long time and basically detailed everything she had done to disrespect me and our marriage and how I felt about all of it. She did apologize for it all and said that this was how she was with all of her friends. She told me all about how she would frequently tell my wife that she'd steal me from her or that she had set me up with another woman that she knew. I told Jess she needed to stop that too. It wasn't right directed at me and it wasn't right directed at her. She accepted that. She said the only reason she thought her jokes were okay was because it was so obvious we'd never cheat on each other. Apparently, Jess was never serious about giving my wife's phone number and she would never actually disrespect our marriage like that. So at least she has some boundaries. Jess even said if my wife ever even came close to cheating, she'd be the first one to stop it, which I doubt, but there's no reason to rock the boat. I apologized to Jess for what I said, but I pretty much just flatly told her that her and I were not friends, so it wasn't appropriate for her to talk to me like that. She was pretty hurt by that, but said she understood. I then asked her if she had any jealousy towards our relationship, and she admitted that she did. She said she wished she had a relationship like that, and that it was pretty clear that my wife and I truly do love each other. So everyone saying she was jealous gets a cookie. So yeah, she apologized and so did I. Do I buy it completely? Of course not. Do I think at least some of it was performance, just crocodile tears? Yes, absolutely. Do I think she's sorry and will be better? I'd like to think so. Not the jerk. Your wife is the biggest jerk. She's allowed Jess to talk down to you for years and done nothing. You deserve better. You are out of her league. Jess is obviously a jerk for treating you like this and trying to get your wife to see other men for years. She should be banned from the house. OP. I wouldn't say my wife's done absolutely nothing. I mean, she has told Jess that her comments are inappropriate before. But I honestly think my wife has a hard time standing up to Jess in general. Not even just about me, but Jess also says inappropriate things about my wife and my wife still doesn't say much. Not the jerk. And your wife should not be allowing Jess to disrespect you, especially in your own home. I think you should lay some ground rules out for your wife about how Jess treats you and what you're willing or not willing to tolerate. Jess is very much the jerk here, but your wife is a close second for not stepping in. Dude, everyone sucks here big time. She was also being nasty and I'm shocked your wife and you apparently have been letting this dynamic go on for over a decade. But you said that in front of a five-year-old? About her parents? To dunk on your wife's friend in the meanest way you could think of? Of course, that was a vindictive move. Well, who do you think is the jerk? OP or Jess? Please let us know. If wife ever did actually want to cheat, Jess would totally encourage it and be happy probably. Always keep people like Jess out of your life, unless you're as crappy of a person as she is. Am I the jerk for telling my wife we can no longer afford to give our dog an allowance? We got a dog a few years ago and training him was rough. He was already a full-grown dog and had never lived inside. Anyway, we'd give him treats and encouragement and eventually he stopped being so wild inside and chewing things up and he now uses the bathroom outside, etc. Like I said, we already give him treats for doing good things or listening to commands, etc. But in the midst of the initial training, my wife came up with the idea that we should give him a weekly allowance for being good and not having accidents, etc. This was set to $25 a week. Of course, we didn't give him the cash. Instead, she'd take him to PetSmart and whatever he started sniffing or seemed to like, she'd buy or she'll get him special treats beyond what we already have at home. I thought it was silly then, but whatever. I was just happy when we'd go a week without him going to the bathroom on the carpet or chewing up a pillow, so I agreed. And it's been this way for years. But now, money is tight. We can't really afford $100 a month extra. Not only that, but that money takes priority over our own allowances. For instance, I wanted to go out to eat last week, but because I have to set aside $50 every paycheck, my wife said we couldn't go, otherwise we wouldn't be able to essentially pay our dog. Not to mention going outside to the bathroom or not chewing things up is second nature for him now, and it's not like I don't want to buy him stuff, but we're barely making ends meet at the moment. $50 a check is a big expense. I brought this up with her last night and she got very upset that I would even suggest not rewarding him, that I was being selfish for wanting to spend the money on myself. I told her we already buy him food and treats and he already has 30 plus chew toys 
and that he doesn't need a bigger bone every week. He doesn't need gourmet food all the time. None of this is even including relatively frequent dog spa visits. She told me I shouldn't have let her get the dog if I didn't want to take care of him. But I do take care of him. We go on walks, play in the backyard. He has a whole room in our house with chew toys and a big bed. I think it's unfair to say I'm not taking care of him because I can't afford to give him a luxurious lifestyle anymore. Or that I'd like to go out to eat or have a little luxury myself every once in a while. But maybe I'm in the wrong. Am I the jerk? Edit. Additional info I meant to mention. My wife cannot have kids due to a medical issue that would put her at high risk and was devastated when she found out, as was I. But we also cannot afford to adopt or even have that desire right now to be honest. Our dog, I think, was her way of coping with this and being a mother in some sense. So he is like our kid. I love him too, but she's attached to him in a way that is much deeper than what I would say is typical. Edit 2. She does not believe the allowance is teaching him anything. It's just her way of doting on him. She knows that he is not associating it with good behavior, so it's not an attempt at teaching him anything. More of, he's been good, so we should do something good for him. Edit 3. Just going to answer a few more questions by copying my responses. Why doesn't she get a job? Certainly something we could look into, and not something she has said she is opposed to at all. We were completely fine before all of this inflation, but everything going up by a little to a lot has really strained us. It took quite a bit of time to even realize it was happening really because we had had a little bit of a cushion and when you are slowly breaking even or dipping in 10 to 20 a check, I just didn't realize how little wiggle room we actually had. Now I'm just looking at what expenses are the most frivolous and what I can cut out. So really, it's been the last couple of weeks to a month that I've begun stressing about it. Dog allowance? I do think a lot of people in here are unfairly criticizing her because of the phrasing of dog's allowance. This is really her allowance to spend on our dog. I think maybe I've done a poor job communicating the finer details which wasn't my intention. Why doesn't she get out more or make friends? She does take him to the park and on walks, but also she's very introverted. I've tried suggesting she hang out with her friends more, but she rarely ever does. Plus, most of her friends have kids now, and she doesn't admit it, but I know it hurts her. A couple of them didn't even want kids, and I think she just feels jealous or like it's unfair. Not that they have kids, but that she can't. Not the jerk. I love my dogs, but this is insane. Your dog can play with the stick you find outside. He doesn't need expensive treats every week, and he only needs healthy, not the most expensive, foods. Good grief. Not the jerk. Based on your edit, your wife needs therapy. She is overcompensating for not having a kid by focusing on spoiling the dog. Bottom line, you can't afford anything extra right now. Maybe that will change in a few weeks, but you can't afford it right now. If she wants to continue to spend $100 a month on the dog, then she can sacrifice something else if it's really that important to her. You are not neglecting the dog. He sounds cared for and in a loving home. Not the jerk. She's prioritizing your dog over your relationship based on what you're saying, and it's completely unfair to suggest you don't care about the dog. I think it's good she loves him so much, and it would be nice if you could give him all of the extras, but it does not sound like you are in a place to do so financially. And dogs don't need all of that to feel happy or loved. My roommate's entitled boyfriend demands to park his car in our driveway. I'm an undergraduate college student and I live with four other undergraduate college students. All of us are 20 to 22 female. We have a pretty decent five bedroom house with a small yard and two car driveway with a garage, which we use for storage. For a college town, we live in a pretty nice area but parking can sometimes be a nightmare. All five of us have long-term boyfriends. Four out of five of us have cars. When we moved into the house last summer, we agreed that the driveway spots would go to two of the roommates. Our fifth roommate, A, was one of the roommates that was promised a spot. Unfortunately, she was T-boned just before we moved in and her car was totaled. Even though she really needs one to get her to classes and internship, A's parents do not want to buy a new one and she can't currently afford to buy one herself. Instead, she has her boyfriend drive her wherever she needs to go. A's boyfriend parks in the extra spot in the driveway whenever he comes over, and he's over for at least six hours a day, every day, and sometimes overnight. We, the four other roommates, have asked A and her boyfriend numerous times to park elsewhere, like at least six or seven times. We've talked to both of them separately and together to no avail. No matter the amount of conversations, 
A's boyfriend continues to park his car in the one remaining driveway spot. This has been going on for almost a year. We, the four other roommates, have all told our boyfriends not to park in the driveway and they have abided by our requests. A sees nothing wrong with this situation as she was promised a spot at the beginning of the summer and she thinks that since they're sharing a car, he has a right to park there now. However, since the circumstances just happen to be that she doesn't have a car right now, the other four of us think that if the spot should go to somebody, it should be someone whose name is on the lease for our house, as three of us could really use the extra driveway spot. When A's boyfriend isn't parked there, we rotate who gets to use it. Of course, this rarely happens. It got pretty heated today as one of my roommates came home to see A's boyfriend in the driveway again, and she said that if it happens one more time, she'll be calling the police. I really don't want the cops to get involved, but I am kind of fed up of him parking there and feel a little disrespected that she won't just ask him to move. Maybe I'm just being too harsh. Are we being unfair? Are we the jerks? Edit. Here's some more info regarding why we promised her the spot. We originally agreed to let her have the spot because she had a small sedan, and we did not know if any of the remaining three roommates' cars would even fit in the driveway. Two pickup trucks and a large SUV. This was prior to us moving in. Once we moved in, however, we realized that the driveway was long enough that any of our cars could fit, granted only two at a time, and we loosely started who rotated. This was until her boyfriend started parking there and she claimed that he shouldn't have to move. Not the jerk. The parking spot is for the people on the lease. If the person on the lease is no longer parking there and there's no plans for that to be changing anytime in the near future, the parking space should go to someone else on the lease. Am I the jerk for being annoyed at my girlfriend after she turned off the power during her cooking while I was gaming? I, male 24, have been dating Helen, female 22, for two years and we moved in together two months ago. This is my parents' old second home. My parents gave it to me when I moved out of the family home five years ago. Helen and I are very happy with this house because it's comfortable and well located. There's just a little problem with the kitchen. There are two ovens, one big and one small. The small one works well, but sometimes the big one cuts off the power when it switches off. You just have to turn the power back on on the meter. It's not every time, maybe once every five times. But to avoid that, I always use the small oven, which was more than enough when I was living alone. When Helen moved in, at first, we took turns cooking, but she quickly insisted to manage the cooking alone. She thinks my cooking is a bit too basic. Her parents own a restaurant, so I guess she has higher standards and she cooks better than I do. I once suggested that we could cook together sometimes so I could improve, but she doesn't want that because she finds me too messy in the kitchen. I warned her about the big oven and to prioritize the smaller one or to let me know before using the big one. I like to play football manager on my computer before dinner and it would be a shame to have a power cut at this moment. If she tells me beforehand, I can save my game in case of a power cut. Two weeks ago, Helen used the big oven without telling me and the power went out. While I was playing, I gently reminded her to warn me next time and it's okay, I had saved a few minutes before and everyone can forget or mess up. Yesterday, she wanted to make cookies and use the big oven again without telling me. I was playing and I hadn't saved for several in-game weeks. Stupid, I know. So, it was lost. I was annoyed and I asked why she didn't warn me. Instead of apologizing, she said aggressively to get over it, that I shouldn't get upset about that stupid game. After all, cooking the dinner was much more important. I got angry and answered that she shouldn't disrespect my hobbies like that and she could just enjoy her so much more important dinner alone, and I stormed off. I went to visit a friend, who's 24, male, to vent, and I ended up sleeping there. I told my girlfriend by message that I will sleep there and it's best to talk tomorrow. My friend thinks that Helen messed up and is in the wrong, but this morning I received a text from a friend of Helen calling me a huge jerk. After reflecting on it, I started to feel bad. Maybe I did overreact or I was completely in the wrong. Everyone sucks here. Fix the electrical issue, save your game, don't complain when someone is making your meals while you're playing games. Apologize for overreacting and not handling conflict appropriately. Don't storm off. She should apologize for not telling you she was using the big oven and for getting angry at you when you pointed it out. You should also ask if she's upset that you are gaming while she's doing chores and work out that issue. Everyone sucks here. Get the oven fixed, that's a problem. Perhaps also buy a small UPS for your computer if you're unwilling to do that. 
Now, if you went into the kitchen ranting about losing your progress, then it's only you who is to blame. But she, according to your side of the story, overreacted. However, storming out of the house over something this trivial is ridiculous. You aren't 12, and it makes me question the reliability of your point of view. You're the jerk. She's in the kitchen making your dinner while you're playing games, and you're angry that she forgot to ask your permission? That's not reasonable. You overreacted. It's a game. If it bothers you that much, get the oven fixed and get some cooking lessons. It's amazing to me how many of these posts are based on an argument starting over gaming. Grow up and fix your electrical before your house burns down and you don't have a computer at all. Am I the jerk for being angry that I wasn't asked to be in the wedding party? I'm 28 female and one of my best friends, Mark, 28 male, just got engaged and he and his fiance are planning to get married next spring. For context, Mark and I have been good friends since high school. My boyfriend, who's 28, has also really bonded with Mark over the past two years of us dating, and they regularly go golfing together. We have also done a lot of couples vacations and dates and outings together, and we were seemingly very close to Mark and his fiance. My boyfriend and I just recently went to their house for a party, and Mark and his fiance asked my boyfriend, whom they know through me, and only for a couple of years, to be in the wedding party as a groomsman. I was not asked to be a bridesmaid, so I would not be involved in the wedding party at all. When I asked Mark about this, he said it was because they wanted even numbers, five groomsmen and five bridesmaids for the wedding party, and that his fiancée already had enough bridesmaids. I thought for sure I would be asked to be in their wedding as a bridesmaid, seeing as they were my good friends, and I would have 100% included them in my wedding party if I were the one getting married. So not only was I not asked to be in their wedding party, but my boyfriend, whom they had known for all of two seconds, was. I felt very hurt that they would ask him to be a part of their big day, but not me. I confronted Mark about how hurt, sad, and angry I was about this, especially because I don't know if my boyfriend and I will even still be together a year from now. Mark told me that he was sorry that my feelings were hurt, but he and his fiancée don't want to apologize for doing what they want with their wedding. Mark told me that this situation has impacted our friendship, especially since he doesn't think they have anything to apologize for. My boyfriend declined to be a groomsman, and we haven't spoken to Mark since. Am I the jerk? Edit. Just to clarify, I never expected to be asked to be in their wedding. Of course I would have loved to be in their wedding party because they are my friends. I've been friends with Mark since I was 16, and friends with Alyssa, his fiancée, for going on 8 years now and I would love to celebrate their love and happiness, but I never ever demanded it. If they never would have asked either of us to be in their wedding, I would have been totally fine with that. It's that they asked everyone else in our friend group to be in it, including my boyfriend. Everyone except me. When Alyssa, Mark's fiance, talked to me about it, she said the only reason she didn't ask me to be in the wedding was because of the matching wedding party numbers, which was disappointing and hurtful. I totally understand that it's their wedding and they should do what they like, but I also hoped they wouldn't exclude me like that because of wedding party numbers. I know everyone says to not make it about me, but what do you do in that situation? Not say anything at all? I just felt a little blindsided. Maybe Mark and I weren't as close as we thought. Perhaps it's all for the best. Note, people are taking the boyfriend bit way out of context. My boyfriend and I have been off and on because of long distance issues, but we love each other deeply. He's currently living back home, but that might change in the near future. He might have to move across the country for work, and I'm not sure if I'm ready to uproot my life and move with him yet. That's why I'm not sure where we'll be a year from now. It's all up in the air currently. You're the jerk. Groom has been socializing solo with your boyfriend for two years, which you changed to all of two seconds at the end of your story, and selected him as a groomsman. No mention here of you socializing solo with the fiancé, and she probably picked people she was closer to. You're not owed a spot in the bridal party just because your boyfriend got one. You're being a bit dramatic here over a wedding that's not even yours. I know I'm going to get massively downvoted for this, but after going back and forth, I'm going with everyone sucks here rather than you're the jerk because I feel like ultimately your friends are being the bigger jerks. Mark and his fiance should have known ahead of time that it's kind of insulting that you've been his good friend since high school and he's including your boyfriend in his wedding party and not you. I think the considerate thing to have done was to not include you both or at least have a proper conversation with you about it. I think you crossed the line by expecting to be a bridesmaid, confronting him about it and saying that stuff about your boyfriend. The last thing was really not cool. 
Isn't it amazing how much people fight over weddings? Not as amazing as how much money people waste on them. Boss tries to give disciplinary action for working too hard. Midway through my career, I found myself working for the most prominent private college in my state. I was in the IT department and was in charge of maintaining a few servers and all of the technology in classrooms. Every summer, we would receive our budget for the year, and the part of the budget I managed was spent mostly on upgrading the audio and visual presentation systems in the classrooms, and most of that work had to take place during the summer. This is fine, normally, but our college administration had created a ticking time bomb for me a few years before. They had decided to spend about $100,000 on a few classrooms, but did not allocate any money in our budget to replace that equipment when it would eventually fail. I had been there for five years, and now that equipment was starting to fail. Increasing our budget was not an option, despite faculty growing to depend on the equipment in these spaces. I was left to figure out how to make the same budget replace all of the equipment in those spaces as well as the normal set of classrooms that would need to be upgraded elsewhere. Fine, I was up for the challenge. I had to simplify and purchase more value brand of equipment and do extra work to cut corners. A couple of weeks of shipping delays for the majority of the equipment saw me with roughly one month to rip out, replace, rewire, and configure around 15 classrooms, as well as update and test all of the existing classrooms within about a month before the semester began. Realizing the amount of work ahead of me, I began working. I came in every day of the week for 28 days straight, working 8 to 10 hours to ensure that when the semester began, the professors would have working equipment. I was salary, so I did not have to clock in. This gave me the freedom of scheduling work as little or as much as required. I worked myself sick and was literally sick at the end of the 28 days. My supervisor was a guy we recently hired. Let's call him Gus. Near the beginning of the semester, while testing equipment, I realized that the audio driver and a common model of computer we have in the classrooms was corrupted. Investigating it, I realized that the computer manufacturer had corrupted drivers on their web server where we downloaded it from. I asked my supervisor who was in charge of managing the image deployment server to rebuild the image with a non-corrupt version of the driver I had provided him. He said he would. I swing by the next day and ask him if he had completed the rebuild. He had not. I tell him I really need it as the semester loomed closer and closer and he tells me he will work on it. Next day, nothing. Day after that, nothing. Finally, he figures it out and I continue my work. He must not have liked being pressured and perhaps the perception that he was incompetent. He was, must have gotten to him. He decides to power trip and call me into his office and ask why I was working so much. I explained the administrative oversight a few years prior, shipping delays, cheaper equipment, extra required work, and his delaying of a working image. I tell him, look, I came in day after day after day asking for that rebuilt image. Each time I said day, I'm poking my finger straight down on the edge of his desk enough that it makes a sound to emphasize that those delays hurt the work I was doing. He wanted to find some personal failing that he could pull out some form of disciplinary action around. I gave him none. Eventually he ran out of ideas and I left his office, not thinking much of it. Gus, however, was a jerk of the highest order. He would follow our IT director like a puppy. He joined a band with my IT director, so my work situation was not exactly fair. The semester began, and not a single issue in all of the classrooms was reported. I was proud of my work I was able to complete, given the challenges. The second day of the semester, my IT director calls me to his office. There, Gus is sitting beside him, and they both want to talk to me. I don't like the looks of this. My IT director starts asking me about why I was working so much. I explained to him, as I did Gus, the various factors that made this summer's work extra challenging. This destroyed any valid criticism they could muster. Gus goes on to say that he innocently inquired about my work and that I became violent, talking about the gesture I made on his desk, illustrating his failure to do his work in a timely manner. I demonstrate exactly what I did on the IT director's desk to show how ridiculous this claim was. My IT director wanted to exert his authority and they would not stop until they had something to discipline me with. Nothing I would say would change the result. I was to be in trouble for whatever transgression they imagined up in this meeting. I make sure to point out how long it took Gus to do the small task that I depended on, knowing I could have completed it in about an hour. He was incompetent. 
My IT director then alludes to the fact that I should respect Gus more, as he is my supervisor. Forget it, I think to myself. I then tell my director, It is as if Justin Bieber was trying to teach you about music theory. It's only going to upset you. This sudden, sharp, and in my opinion, hilarious comparison was too funny. Both Gus and my IT director immediately laughed, even though Gus was subject of this insult. Once they had stopped laughing, my IT director put on a more serious tone. He says that I could manage my time better, despite the unique circumstances of this summer's work. His voice gets really soft and slow while he's talking to me now. This is a trick he forgot he told me that he uses in arguments to make the other person seem like they're out of control. It's condescending, as if spoken to as a child. And now he's using it on me. He tells me that he wants me to take some time management class, also to take a couple days off and think about it. I just want you to think about it. However, he's going to need my keys and badge. Cue malicious compliance. At this point, he has provided me enough evidence that this is not a job I want to stay at. The absurdity of working so hard and for 28 days straight on salary with no extra pay and to be rewarded with a disciplinary action was too much. That in that moment, I had thought about it. Without saying anything, I hand over my badge. I took all the many keys off of my key ring and set them on his desk. I have thought about it. I tell him in the exact same soft and condescending tone he used with me. And you can keep the keys and badge. I told him with the biggest wry smile on my face. I then walk to my office. He follows me and I notice his eyes become glassy, as if he was hurt by the situation unfolding before him. He expected me to capitulate and accept his punishment for a job well done. He kept saying, I just want you to think about it, with each time becoming increasingly desperate, and I kept repeating, I have thought about it. He disappears back to his office with his little minion, Gus, to discuss damage control. I quickly pen an email to all my other coworkers, letting them know I was leaving and that I enjoyed working with them. I had to work quick as I knew they would shut down all my accounts very quickly. I packed up my personal effects and left. Gus and my IT director offered to help me trying to walk back the situation with some small gesture of goodwill, but I was gone. I had been there for five years, but I was willing to walk away the moment he tried to treat me so poorly. I found out a little later that the week before I left, a programmer we hired left after he treated her poorly too. I was not aware of the reason she left when she did, but our office manager shared that she quit abruptly like me without anything lined up given his behavior. About a year later, I hear from the office manager that the IT director had left. Rumor is he was primarily working for another company while in his office at the college, effectively double dipping or making money for two jobs while only doing one. He had been caught doing so and was warned by the administration to stop. He opted to leave instead of owning up to his own dubious behavior. My only regret is that I didn't leave that job sooner. Support our channel by joining as a member today and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.